Namaste. So, with our discussion of sacred offerings as spiritual nourishment, uh, who is being nourished exactly? We'd say that due to the performance of these ritualistic sacrifices and offerings, one gains the positive karma needed to attain higher states, including higher worlds, like the heavenly planets and so on. How does that work? Is it real or is it just a dream? Is it imagination or is there something behind it? Well, <laughs> I was just reading in the Vedanta Sutra, Book 3, Chapter 1, explains all of this in great detail. So let me summarize it. Basically, the living entity is composed of five sheaths. We discussed this before in the series on Uladu Narpadu. And they are the gross body, uh, the food sheath, anakosha, the energy body, pranakosha, the mental body, manomaya kosha, uh, the intelligence, vijnana maya kosha, and finally, the bliss body, ananda kosha. So these five bodies are what we call the soul. When the gross body dies, the other four bodies form the seed of the next embodiment. And that seed goes to the level of density in the universe that is appropriate for its embodiment, for its growth. So what happens because these bodies are subtle, they're invisible, we can't see them under ordinary circumstances. You might use Kirlian photography or something like that to, to for a very crude visualization, but we normally can't see them. But these four bodies depart at the time of death of the gross body, and they go to the next realm, the next loka, or level of density appropriate for that particular being. Now, during one's life, if one performs sacrifice, the elements of the sacrificed uh, substances become aerosolized into fine nanoparticles and they attach themselves to the subtle bodies, the energy body, mental body, intelligence, and bliss bodies. And these elements go with the soul or with the living entity to the next embodiment. And that's why these offerings are called food for the gods. And their remnants are called prashadam, mercy. So this is the mechanism. This is the actual way that the whole thing functions. Huh? It's not just a religious belief. It's actual science. But it's subtle science. It's subjective science, not objective. It can't be measured by our crude so-called scientific instruments, which really aren't very scientific at all. <laughs> because they don't measure the things that affect our destination, our destiny in the next life, and so on. They can't, because the people that make these instruments don't believe in this stuff. They categorically deny the subjective, the reality, uh, the reality of the reality, <laughs> as we discussed in the other series. So science, ordinary material science, can't say anything about it. It doesn't know anything about it because it denies that whole area of research. 
But the ancient sages sure knew about it. And it's all described in the Upanishads. Upanishad, come close, sit down, and listen. Because if you don't listen carefully, you won't understand these things. And if you don't understand, you won't act. And if you don't act, you won't get the result. So if I have any good fortune in this life, it's only because my guru, my Adi guru, recommended that one take up this duty of performing sacrifice. Now, he only explained it in a, a very simple way. You do this sacrifice, you go to heaven. <laughs> he didn't explain exactly how it works because we weren't prepared to hear it. He had certainly studied the Vedanta and Upanishads and Vedas. He knew he could quote their passages from memory. But he also knew that we were incapable of understanding this science at that stage of our development. So he didn't give the detailed knowledge. He only gave the summary, the TLDR. <laughs> Too long, didn't read. So what we're doing when we're performing these sacrifices is that we are creating tiny, tiny particles which adhere to the subtle body. And when they leave the gross body at the time of death, they take these particles with them. And this qualifies them for entrance into the higher realms. See how it works? A person who is bereft of the results of sacrifice sinks downward. Generally, that means he takes an animal body in the next life or just an ordinary human body and suffers a lot. But one who has the uh, results of the remnants of sacrifice attached to his subtle body, if, if in no other form, in the form of impressions, huh? smelling the beautiful incense, huh? hearing the sound of the bell, and the conch and the other sounds. I mean, these are wonderful, <laughs> wonderful impressions which cause great happiness, great bliss. Huh? You can experience it for yourself. Do some of these rituals. Make some of these offerings, if only to a picture. Huh? Even if you have to improvise somehow or other. <laughs> you know, have a picture of your favorite deity or guru or whatever, and then take, take a glass or buy a new glass is better and put some water in it and offer it. Huh? Put a curry leaf in it or, or a tulsi leaf if you have them available and offer it with nice prayers and see what happens. You get happy. I'll never forget the first time I visited a temple. I happened to come just in time for Tulsi Puja. Now, Tulsi is the plant, the sacred plant, which is offered to Vishnu. So just as I arrived in the temple, the Tulsi Puja was starting and I was all dressed up. I was a professional musician. Uh, I was just coming from a gig. I still had my jacket on, you know, and the whole thing, right? So the devotees started chanting. Vrindayai Tulasi Devyai Priyayai Keshavashyacha, and so on. So, for some reason, I just got into it. I took off my jacket, threw it in the corner, and started dancing around this tree. Right? It sounds completely irrational, <laughs> but it made me very happy. And even though I couldn't see why or how it was working, nevertheless, I got the result. And I said, this is it. This is real. All the other temples and, and teachers I had visited were just, just like boring sales pitches to become a disciple and give money, you know. 
But these people were doing actual pujas, huh? taught by their guru, and getting the result. And I got the result immediately. It was like, wow, this works. So do these offerings, these simple, simple procedures. Huh? And later on, we'll show more different ones and everything. But I want to go over this theory of how it works. So that you have some idea in your mind that this is not just religion. This is science. Subtle science of the subjective soul. And because of that, when you do these, you immediately get happy. Why? Well, this is the name of this feeling is auspiciousness. Auspiciousness is something that bodes good for the future. And what could be more wonderful, what could be more auspicious than knowing that you are developing the qualifications for going to a higher world? That you are purifying your mind and body yeah? and you're augmenting your consciousness and your soul, actually, with the food of the gods. And that when you go to the higher realms, you can offer these things to the gods directly, face to face. And they will welcome you into their domains, into their realms. The higher lokas, svarga loka, mahar loka, tapo loka, jnana loka, jana loka, and many, many more. You can go to all these higher places. How? <laughs> By performance of sacrifice. In Bhagavad Gita and in other places, Krishna says, I am the healing herb. I am the, the uh, shruva, huh? the, which is the spoon used to offer the ghee into the sacrificial fire. He says, he says, I am sacrifice. You want to associate with God directly? Perform sacrifice because he is there within the sacrifice, within the act itself. So this karma yoga, even though it's basic, even though it's beginning, beginner stuff, huh, it's very powerful. And you can immediately perceive the result, but you, you have to do it, and you have to do it with the right intention. Not thinking, oh boy, oh, I'm going to go to heaven, you know. I'm going to offer this stuff and then I'm going to sprout wings or something. No. No, you don't think like that. You think, I'm making this offering to please my Lord. And trust Him. He will give you the result. He will make the arrangements. You can't. Come on, it's not within our power to set up our next life. Huh? Not directly. But we can do the things that qualify us to have a better next life. You really want your next life to be like this one? I don't. I want to get out of here. Oops, power went out. Never mind. I've got batteries. <laughs> so... When we do these sacrifices, we should think, this is for the glory of God, not for my glory, not even for my benefit, but that this is to please God. And then, when the time comes to leave this body, as the Ishopanishad says, there's a prayer toward the end, O oh Lord, kindly remember all the good things I have done for you. Because... He will. He has eidetic memory. He, he remembers everything. He doesn't miss a, a beat. So he remembers all these things we've done, all these sacrifices and so on. And he gives us the proper place, the proper destination, according to the karma that we create with our actions. So do yourself a favor. Create some good actions and guarantee yourself a higher place in your next life. Om Tat Sat. Om Hrihi Om.